chapter 17 sticky notes starting on page 462. On 462 we have the decline of air pollutants um, in these cities and they've gone down over time even in Los Angeles. Now in Los Angeles area we still have a ton of air pollutants but they do they have gone down which is great. Um, and that's mainly due to the Clean Air Act and a lot of work from a lot of citizens. All right, next. Um, you also need to know about the um, um, atmospheric brown cloud or the Asian brown cloud. This is a, a new topic and a new term that's only been added to AP Environmental Science in the past about three or four years. So there's a few countries that have an enormous risk of air pollution. And I should actually take out this star because actually it's in your book now. It wasn't in our old book, and I just transferred these sticky notes from the old book. But um, China in particular has horrific air pollution because they burn huge amounts of coal and people are becoming wealthy and they're buying cars and there are no regulations. Now China is beginning to have regulations, um, but that's just the beginning of it because people are dying early due to all of this air pollution. So their life expectancy is decreasing. On page 464, you need to know that industrial smog is also known as gray smog and it mainly comes from factories and power plants that burn coal or oil and these are the specific pollutants that come from industrial smog. So again this is some very specific information that is essential to know. We don't really have industrial smog here in California because our power plants don't really burn coal and oil and we don't have a lot of factories over here burning coal um, our electricity mainly comes from natural gas and hydroelectric power and some nuclear and solar and wind. So we don't really have industrial smog here in California. We, industrial smog is mainly more on the East Coast or other cities or countries too. What we do have here is photochemical smog. So the word photo means light. Um, it's called brown smog because it's the light reactions in here that cause um, this to occur, especially from turning NOx into NO and O3. And so again, refer to the chart on the air pollutants when you're studying because it's going to tell you how light transforms these items. And that's important to know. And you have this here, you have the UV radiation with the light turning things into other things. Going on to 468. So California emission limits are the lowest, which means they're the best. The emission limit, so that doesn't mean the law means like it's weak. What that means is the law is strong because our limits are the lowest, which means you can't emit very much. So um, we actually have it more than the nation. So we our cars in California actually have to produce less air pollution than if you lived in Montana by law. And the reason why is because our air pollution is so bad here that we get special waivers from the EPA to require less emissions. And that's for all of our health. We already have a lot of premature deaths from air pollution that we don't, we want to prevent even more um, air pollution as well. Um, going on to stratospheric ozone thinning. So the ozone hole is caused by chlorofluorocarbons, which the chemical formula is CCl3F. And this occurs when um, these chemicals rob an oxygen atom from the O3 molecule. And so what occurs then is that when it's thinner, more UV rays can reach the Earth. And when more UV rays reach the Earth, 
We have more incidence of skin cancer. So crop damage occurs too, and this is an economic effect. So if you're asked on an FRQ about an economic effect of stratospheric ozone thinning, you can talk about crop damage. Um, more UV rays in decrease the productivity of the ocean's plankton, and that's not good because actually plankton in the ocean provide the majority of our oxygen that we breathe, actually. And so the thinning of the ozone in the stratosphere is not good. So here's a bunch of stuff to know. All right, so first of all, how does ozone form in the stratosphere? Well, we have oxygen gas that takes a free oxygen molecule to create I'm sorry, oxygen atom to create O3 molecule. Then UV breaks it down and back this way, and then it reforms. So we have this cycle that of forming and, and breaking apart, and it, this constant um, situation that goes on. And so we do know this. This was actually on an FRQ um, about two years ago, and this is actually pretty easy to memorize. So this is what happens when chlorofluorocarbons break apart stratospheric ozone. So here's the chlorofluorocarbon. Um, and with UV light, it breaks into a free car, uh, chlorine atom. Then the chlorine atom combines with the O3 and breaks it apart into ClO and oxygen gas. So this O3 is declining overall. And so these are the chemical reactions. Do you need to memorize the chemical reactions? Yes. Um, you don't need to balance any equations, just you need to memorize the equations. On FRQs, if you have, you can explain it in words instead of the actual chemical formulas, that's okay too. They've accepted that as well. So where were CFCs found? They were found in refrigerators, aerosol cans and air conditioners, but they're banned now. So um, we don't have them in there anymore. They were banned with the Montreal Protocol because of the ozone thinning. So one of the things that kids need to remember is that very often on multiple choice, they're gonna ask you the difference between tropospheric ozone and stratospheric ozone. It's the same molecule, it's same O3, but in the troposphere, it's bad, it's an air pollutant down here, and it's formed from NOx coming out of the exhaust pipe of our cars and mixing with um, sunlight and turning into O3, and it's really terrible for our lungs, causes respiratory damage such as asthma. And, but up in the stratosphere, this molecule is good for us because we don't breathe it in the stratosphere, we're not there, it's 10 kilometers high, but it protects us from UV rays. Here's some other info about the ozone hole that you need to know. So ozone damage, ozone hole damage peaked in 2009-2010. We banned actually CFCs about 25 years previous to this, but the CFCs that were produced before the ban had to reach the stratosphere. So it had they had to travel up and it takes them a long time to travel up to the stratosphere. So it peaked but now it's getting better because we banned chlorofluorocarbons um, and they're getting less and less and less, the ozone hole is actually repairing itself. But the ozone hole is worse in the Antarctic spring. So remember they're the southern hemisphere so they have opposite seasons, so that would be September, which is at the end of the winter because of ice crystals. So ice crystals promote fluorofluorocarbons taking oxygen atoms um, away from the O3. So over the winter time, all of that ice during the winter keeps robbing and robbing and robbing the oxygen atoms. And so you have this buildup all throughout winter. And so by the end of winter, which is September for them, um, that's when the ozone hole is the worst because it kept, keeps declining, declining, declining all winter long. These are questions I have seen, not only on FRQs, but multiple choice questions. So this specific information, it's real nitpicky, but it's really important to memorize. Turning the page to 474, so now you need to know that the Montreal Protocol banned CFCs in 1987, 
and is considered the biggest environmental success story. Going on to 473. So uh, now we're going to talk about acid rain. So acid rain is also known as acid deposition, and that's the term that you will see on the AP ex um, exam. So the biggest culprit is from burning coal to release sulfur dioxide, but you can also get acid rain from burning petroleum oil, like in our cars and transportation. But most of it, again, comes from SO2. So what are the problems with acid rain? Oh, and here's the picture down here that the SO2 combines with water and oxygen and oxidants in the atmosphere to turn into sulfuric acid or nitric acid. So it dissolves marble and limestone on statues and tombstones and buildings. So that's a human problem. Now we have environmental problems too. It changes the soil chemistry by elevating aluminum in the soil so the acid when you add acid to soil aluminum actually rises it elevates and that extra aluminum hinders nutrient and water uptake and so you're going to destroy your forests and your other plants because the pH is changing and they can't absorb nutrients and water. Another environmental effect of acid rain is that the lake's pH drops and harms the organisms because they can't survive in that pH it can also damage crops. So that would be a human problem. So human problem, human problem, and then you have environmental problems. All right, so a term that's not in your book but you need to know is called water buffering. So this is the ability of water, like in a lake, to maintain this pH with the addition of acid. And so there are certain minerals in lakes that can provide water buffering. It's not in every lake, but some lakes can tolerate and the addition of acid rain better than others because of this buffering process. Here's our acid rain equations. Do you need to memorize these? Well, if you, if yes and no, um, <clears throat> it's good to be able to recognize them. If you want the extra point on an FRQ, they will sometimes ask you to write out an acid rain equation. This is the equation that comes from burning coal, so you get your sulfur dioxide. This is the, and it's a two-part equation, so this equation and then this equation from burning coal. This is the one from burning oil, like in our cars. This one's easier, so I recommend memorizing this one because you don't need to memorize both, you just need to memorize one if you're ever asked on an FRQ to write out an equation, then you have one in your brain. So there you go. All right, moving on to indoor air pollution. So indoor air pollution here on page 475. Um, <clears throat> this is pollution inside the home or a building. And in developed countries like us, the number one cause of death from indoor air pollution is smoking cigarettes. Now either yourself or secondhand smoke. And the number two cause would be radon. In a developing country, the number one cause of death from indoor air pollution is from cooking fires. A lot of people cook indoors like in India and you can see a picture here. This is actually I believe Africa and they're cooking inside because there's they don't have a yard. They can't cook outside. And so these women breathe in air pollution all the time. You also need to know that radon is naturally occurring in bedrock from the decay of uranium. It's found in basements and it causes lung cancer. How do you get rid of uh, radon or fix the problem, which is mitigation, you can create a vent pipe system and a fan to suck radon out of buildings, or you can create a ventilation system. This is an add-on to your book. Your book doesn't cover how to get rid of radon, so you need to know that. Okay, so here's all our sources in this picture here of indoor air pollution. So no, uh, be able to talk about these sources of indoor air pollution, and how do you mitigate, which means fix the problem. You can open windows. You can, plants will take in indoor air pollution, so have a lot of indoor plants. Choose vac free paint and varnish when you paint your house. Don't smoke. Choose less toxic products like natural products from the store for cleaning. And no fires indoors, and those will all help with indoor air pollution. And we have a couple more sticky notes we'll do on the next video.